What's up guys? Welcome back to the basement. Nathan, Toolbox, Bert. So, um, haven't done a, a video in a little bit, and I have finished being productive for the evening. Did some rearranging in the shop, built some shelving. Um, I have floor space again, which is awesome. Uh, it's fantastic. Trying to do some rearranging, um, because hopefully here soon, uh, I've, I've kind of gotten to the point where most of my projects, I've, I've got to have a mill. I can't keep outsourcing everything, so... Uh, looking at buying a little bitty thing to maybe do some some work here at home. Hopefully, I'll be able to make some cool stuff to share with you guys, uh, and we'll we'll see when I can squeeze that. So uh, I figured, you know what? We haven't done a video in a little bit, and I've got some stuff laying around. Kind of have the itch to put some together. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do a basic rundown of how to build an autocopter. Now we'll go into the fine tuning stuff. And, you know, we've covered doing hammer lugs, we've covered doing trigger work. Uh, so for the most part, this is going to be, how do I assemble stuff? How, how do we slap everything together? We're going to pretend that this is a body that we have, you know, just picked up, picked something up off the internet or your local whatever the hell, and you've already stripped everything apart. So we're working with uh, basically all the components. I've kind of rounded some stuff up. I may be doing a little parts hunting while we're talking about stuff. Uh, we'll go over just some, some real basic ways uh, of putting things together. And if you want, we can do some uh, another video on, you know, uh, the differences between pre-2K and post-2K and all the specifics as far as what we're working with. I may cover some of that on the way. I'm just kind of winging it for now. So, got everything set up. I'm going to probably readjust the camera a little bit, put it over here where I can show you some tools and whatnot. We'll go over kind of what you need to have handy. Um, what I have found to be really, uh, really nice to have on hand, because there are a few things that, you know, you don't necessarily need, but they are handy to have when you're building one. Um, and we'll just kind of put everything together. We're not going to go over timing or anything just yet. I'll probably make another video for that. In the meantime, we're going to be working with a, uh, a pre-2K spec uh, left feed body tonight that I've had laying around for a while. I haven't done anything with. We're going to kind of go for a... Uh, Kind of a hot rod look, you know, nice dust black and chrome. Uh, just some parts I had laying around. Might as well do something with them. So we're going to build ourselves a little hot rod here tonight. And then uh, hopefully in another video we'll do some tuning. And we'll show you how to make it shoot like a hot rod. Um, and I may do some, some work in between about how, uh, how little things make a difference in, inside the gun when you're, you know, putting stuff together. We've already covered a lot of that. So... Uh, got everything laid out. I'm going to rearrange the camera. And as always, you know, uh, take note if there's anything that I don't cover right or, you know, if you don't uh, if you don't understand, if there's something I need to explain a little better or something you want uh, done a little more in depth, just let me know. So, here we go. All right. So we've rearranged a little bit. And like I said, we're going to pretend that this is a body or a, a hole marker that you picked up, you've stripped down, uh, you've already broken everything apart, and for the most part, I'm going to go ahead and skip cleaning uh, on this particular video. If you guys want a video on how to clean stuff, uh, it's really not super complicated. A lot of guys will use a, uh, a Sonic cleaner, which is really, really nice. You can pick them up pretty cheap at, uh, you know, like Harbor Freight, something like that. Um, they, they do a really, really nice job. I don't have one, and I've never used one. So I, I, I will tell you, you know, you can't get by without one. They're just really nice to have. Normally what I will do, scrub everything down with alcohol and a bunch of Q-tips. And uh, like I said, I, I'll try not to make you guys sit through cleaning up any of this stuff. We're just going to do a build. So a couple things that you're probably going to want to have on hand. Um, obviously you have all of your parts. Lay everything out where you can see what you're working with, where you know where everything is, and you can kind of take stuff step by step. Okay, so your workspace is really important. Personally, I prefer to work on a tech mat because I like having little spots to put my hardware and old O-rings uh, so I don't get them mixed in with new O-rings. Uh, holding my Allen keys, obviously. Uh, you're going to want to have a set of standard Allen keys. Um, I also recommend, uh, personally, I, I don't recommend using ball end Allen keys. Biggest thing is if you, if you have to put any serious torque on a, an allen key to break something apart and let's face it some of these markers have been sitting in someone's basement for you know 15 20 years um, if you have to take apart something with some serious torque and you try to do it with a ball end allen key you're going to snap that ball end off 
uh, inside whatever component you're trying to remove and then it just becomes a nightmare because now that portion of the allen key is wedged against whatever you're trying to remove and you have to try to break it loose or you have to drill it out and it's just a nightmare so we're not going to mess with uh, ball end allen keys with the exception of a couple uh, I, I do keep uh, I believe that's a three millimeter metric on hand uh, ball end allen key for the simple reason that most, uh, most, you know, any of your your frame screws and whatnot, or frame bolts, are going to be you're going to be using an eighth inch Allen key. Like I said, most of the stuff you're going to be working with is standard. We've got a good tight fit there. However, a three millimeter is really, really close enough that it will grab. So I keep one of these here because uh, when you're putting, when you're installing a frame, and you have the, you know, the the trigger guard in the way. It's, uh, it can be kind of a pain to get around and have to do a quarter turn at a time or whatever you have to work with uh, with an eighth inch allen key. So you can take this three millimeter, get your bolt started by hand, and then take in there, spin most of that down, and then finish tightening it with an eighth inch allen key. So uh, for most autocockers out there, um, especially ones that came out, you know, are a stock uh, configuration, the VASA bolt which is the bolt that obviously attaches the VASA, this one right here, is a 12-point bolt, which means you need a 12-point socket. There are 12 points in here. Um, I would recommend getting either a slimline socket or a uh, possibly even a quarter-inch drive. This one is a 3 8 drive that I just happen to have around in my toolbox, so it's what I use. But if you have a slimline socket or a, uh, a quarter inch drive socket, you, it's much smaller. So if you're working with a 15 degree VASA, it's easier to get in there and get on it. Now, some people have replaced that particular bolt with a, a hex headed bolt so that you don't have to mess with it. Uh, it's not a bad idea. You'll run into it from time to time. So we also have a bunch of Q-tips over here. We have our little Mickey's grenade lid that we're going to use to put rubbing alcohol in. Also have a big old jug of rubbing alcohol right there. Uh, you're always going to want to have some, you know, some Q-tips and some rubbing alcohol on hand to clean everything up. Uh, you're also going to want to have a rag. Uh, these are actually my old underpants. When my stuff wears out, it goes in the rag bag, still gets used. So, uh, like I said, we've got everything laid out. A couple, uh, a couple other things. Um, I do have uh, red Loctite and blue Loctite. Blue Loctite is a semi, uh, it's not even a semi-permanent seal, it's basically just a sealing Loctite is all it is. It adds a little bit of resistance. It's a thread locker is what it is. So it can be used as a sealant. Uh, that's what I'll typically use on barbs, um, you know, hose barbs for either rams, three ways, etc. Red Loctite is the devil, but it does have its place. Red Loctite is a semi-permanent bond Loctite that normally requires heat to remove. So the only place that I will ever use red Loctite in a marker is on the junction between the ram shaft and the pump arm, mainly because I know a lot of guys use some lower resistance um, seal or thread lockers. Uh, this is one thing that I have had so much trouble with them walking around, and I, I can't stand it. It throws your stuff out of adjustment. You start to get back block slap. That is the one place in, in any autococker that I will ever use red Loctite. And for that reason, you want to have at least a small torch on hand. Uh, got that one for normal stuff. If things are stubborn, we have a larger butane torch. For larger materials or larger projects that you're taking apart, you may need a propane torch. Uh, but a small butane torch will do you a lot of good. Uh, let's see what else. You're obviously going to need a cocker valve tool for anything other than an autococker that uses an 11 16 valve. Any autococker that uses a 9 16 valve should have a valve lock nut in the lower tube. And we'll see that when we go to putting internals in. Uh, I have some assorted other tools over here, some picks, some pliers, um, some very, very small side cutters for trimming hoses. Uh, uh, some dental picks as well, not just standard picks. We'll go over some of that. Um, and also, honestly, one of my favorite tools ever for working on cockers. These are uh, a pair of Nipex or Nipex uh, flat-jawed slip joint pliers. 
So as you can see, no teeth in the jaw, very square. These work exactly like, uh, let's say, an adjustable wrench as far as getting on the flats of things, but they lock much harder, so you don't really have as much chance of, lock, or of uh, slipping and rounding fittings or the base of an LPR or anything like that. They're also a little thinner in the jaw. So these are one of my little trade secrets. I absolutely love these things. They are a lifesaver for putting stuff together. That being said, also do have a small adjustable wrench. We've got some Teflon, we've got some polish, we've got all kinds of different stuff. And we also have a good assortment of O-rings. Now you can buy kits out there that have all sorts of different O-rings. You can buy them as Cocker specific kits. Um, this is one that I've put together myself just because this is essentially a collection of everything that I run into uh, using on a normal basis teching most auto cockers. Obviously there's some exceptions out there, there's some goofy stuff. Uh, if you want we can talk about that in another video. Literally all this is, this is an old, uh, I believe an A5 parts kit, uh, I think, that I gutted everything out and just kind of rearranged to my own liking. We got some extra barbs, some uh, extractors, all kinds of different stuff. So good stuff to have on hand. Uh, another thing that, uh, well, we'll go over that if we do a rebuild video on components. Uh, for today, we're going to skip on that. Now, we're also going to want to have some oil on hand. Uh, some people will also like to have some grease on hand, Dow 33 preferably. For those of you that don't know, Dow 55 is another uh, relatively commonly available one, but Dow 55 is actually formulated to soak in and swell O-rings, which is not something we want to do here. Uh, this is not above long. So, we're just going to be working with oil. Uh, this is just an old tub of gold cup that I've been using forever. Gold cup works. Unfortunately, they're not making it anymore. Um, any pneumatic tool oil will work. Some guys use three-in-one oil or tri-flow. There's a lot of different preference, preferences, a lot of good oils out there. Um, biggest thing, honestly, biggest rule there is you do not want to use actual gun oil, actual firearm oil. Uh, firearm oils are made to penetrate and condition metals, um, but they react very, very badly with uh, O-rings. Okay, They will soak in and basically turn your O-rings into gummy bears, and gummy bears don't seal worth a damn. So, we've got most of our stuff laid out. If we run into anything else, we'll go over some other specialty tools. We basically know what we need to have on hand, so we're going to start putting stuff together. Now, like I said, I'm going to spare you for the most part, the, uh, the quote-unquote rebuild part. We'll do a quick cursory overview. So this, for example, this is your BASA. So that's going to be our first, uh, that's the way, the way I'm going to be putting stuff together is obviously the way I put stuff together. Um, there's a bunch of different ways of doing it. Everyone has their own preference. I'm just going to show you what I do, and you, know, you can kind of go from there. A lot of the times, depending on if you have Loctite setting on certain parts, you may wait on certain parts and mess with other ones. So we're just going to go over, uh, you know, throwing everything together. So what I usually do, it's a brand new body that we picked up. We know nothing about it. So strip everything out and clean it. Um, like I said, a lot of guys will use sonic cleaners for these. I don't have one. So I usually will scrub stuff down with alcohol. If it's really grungy, I will take it and actually scrub it down in my sink with really, really hot water and a little bit of tiny bit of soap. Um, take some squeegees, run them in the internal channels into the lower tube, clean everything out as best you can so you're working with a nice, fresh, clean body. Then we're going to take our BASA. And if you'll notice, there we go. Uh, where'd it go? Oh. There we go. There's a hole on one side. Okay, This is where our timing rod is going to go through. The timing rod has to connect to the three-way. The three-way is going to be mounted on the right-hand side or passenger side of the front block for the majority of most front blocks. Uh, so that hole, in turn, needs to go on the right-hand side or the uh, passenger side of our body. So in here, we've cleaned everything out already. Uh, there is an O-ring at the top. This is a pre-2K VASA, which you can tell by the fact that the shoulders are squared off because pre-2K spec bodies are squared off in the front, so they have to match up. So this O-ring here, if I remember correctly, the one I'm using here is a 116. Um, 
what that means when people talk about O-rings, if they talk about, say, a, uh, a 003 or a 112 or whatever that is, the first number in that three-digit number is actually what they call the series of that O-ring. And the further up you go in series, the thicker the O-ring is. So, for example, a, you know, a one-series O-ring is going to be thicker than a zero-series O-ring. So when they talk about a 003, that is a zero-series, zero-three size O-ring. Um, in this case, we're working with a 116. That means this is a one-series uh, thickness, it's number 16 size O-ring. Now, the numbers in between different... Uh, in between different series of O-rings don't necessarily match up to the same, you know, say, internal diameter or anything like that. A, uh, a 0, 1, 3 will not be the same size as a 1, 1, 3. That's, that's just not how they work. So, we've replaced this O-ring with a 1, 16. We're going to kind of start threading this in here. Anytime you're putting stuff together, 90% of the time you are threading steel bolts into a block of aluminum. So, hard metal versus soft metal, hard metal is going to win. Okay, So you do not have to torque the living crap out of these. Uh, give them a good squeeze so that they're not going to come apart. The fact is, if you really torque down on one of these, uh, you can cause yourself some problems. You can strip that, uh, that bolt hole out, and then you have to mess with HEVA coils, and it's just, it's just a nightmare. So we have our BASA installed. Um, now what we're going to do is do our front block. Um, this is a pre-2K spec front block. This is a pre-2K spec banjo bolt. Now what's the difference? As you can see, it's got a pretty small hole for the banjo. Now if we look at a 2K spec banjo right next to a pre-2K spec, quite a bit of difference in diameter, okay? So this is one of the differences when you're talking about pre-2K versus post-2K bodies. Now, the banjo bolt itself is a bolt that is hollow. A banjo bolt in general, no matter what you're talking about, is a bolt that is used to fasten something but still allow flow through that bolt. So it's hollow down here, we have ports along the side, and what that does is, let's see, so if we have our tank, Tank puts pressure out into the regulator, our high pressure regulator, that puts air through the VASA into the valve chamber of our body, and that banjo bolt allows the air from the valve chamber to come through into the hollow portion of the front block so that you can take the high pressure air and get it to the low pressure regulator in your front block, and that's what's going to run our pneumatics. So, we take our banjo bolt, we have replaced the O-rings here, these are a 012 or a number 12. Um, most people, when they're talking about O rings, will usually omit the suffix of the zero uh, or the prefix of the zero when they're talking about zero series O rings just because it's kind of understood. So, as always, when you're working with O rings, uh, if it's a rubber seal like that, lubricate it. Uh, that's what your oil's for. So, every O ring that's going into this has had a little bit of oil put on it. So, we're just going to take and install our front block, get that mostly spinning, seat it down against the body, fail at grabbing the correct key, and we're going to snug this down. So like I said before, if, this, if something is fighting you like crazy, don't, don't force it, okay? You're threading stuff into aluminum. Uh, don't, don't force it, or you may end up with some problems later on. So we have that stuff installed. I pulled out just some really basic um, internals. I uh, figured since we're going with kind of an older body, we would go a little bit old school. We've got an old crusty Sheridan-style valve here. I'm going to clean this stuff up real quick, then we'll go over putting the guts in the lower tube, okay? Okay, so just gave stuff a real quick scrub down. We have covered in some other videos talking about how important it is to pay attention to the small components of each component, um, but this is not that video, so 
we're going to talk about it, but we're not going to do it. If you want to do it, you know, we can uh, we can make another video on that. But there are a couple things. We have our valve, which is the valve body. This one, like I said, is more of a Sheridan style valve. Um, so this particular one is pretty crusty, but for the most part, our ceiling surfaces look okay. We've cleaned the chunks of stuff out. What I would normally do is take the valve stem and cup seal here, and I would normally put a half decent polish on the stem of the valve. You always want to make sure that the sealing surface of your cup seal is good. There's no gouges. There's no, the big thing is you want to be looking for a gouge from inside to outside or one that's going to cross the, uh, the sealing surface itself. Same thing goes for the valve. If you look at this sealing surface here and there's gouges or dings or chips in it or something like that, um, you know, that's something that you want to, address, want to address and we would do that. You can recondition a valve to a certain point. We would do that normally through a process called lapping. Um, which is something we can go over in another video. Um, so, like I said, for the most part, just kind of took everything real quick, gave it a quick scrub down, because we're just going to show you how to throw stuff together. So, we're going to need a cocker valve tool. This one in particular is a cap cocker valve tool. I really like it. It's pretty. Keeps stuff in place, and it works. Um, I believe there's a lot of guys who make them. There's a ton of guys who sell them. Um, Super Stanchy has some, I believe, that he makes. Uh, Lucas Ter Terrell, Terrell made some for the group a while back. Uh, they were really cool ones. I think he even made some that had a, uh, a bottle top opener built in. This is just the one I keep on the bench. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our valve retention nut and go ahead and put it onto our valve tool. Now, one thing that I like to do when I'm putting stuff together, on the valve spring itself, I like to kind of squeeze the very last coil down at the bottom so that it actually grabs the valve stem. Just one less loose part to be floating around inside. I'm going to put a quick dab of oil on the O-ring for the valve, which on a 916 valve, this O-ring here is a number 12 or a 012. We're going to oil the face of the cup seal oil all that, a little oil on the valve stem itself, and then we're going to kind of stack everything together here so we're working with an assembly and not having to fight that screw, or not that having to fight that spring is kind of nice. So take our body, upend it, slip it on up in there, and you kind of have to give it a little wiggle here and there just to make sure things line up once you hit those threads and again this is a point where if something's fighting you don't fight back okay this is not something that you want to fight this is why cleaning your threads is important sometimes you'll run into boogered up threads or threads that are full of gunk from years of use like what it seems like we're working with here There we go. Okay. So, perfect example right there. Those threads had probably been a little beat up. It is an older body. Um, serial number 51355. That probably means something to someone. What we're looking for... Uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get a good, vid or a good shot of it. But inside this particular hole, this is where our valve retention uh, screw is going to go, or valve retention bolt. Really all it is is a little set screw that keeps your valve from pivoting around. Uh, this is where that's going to go. So what we want to do, we know that on the other side of this hole going up into our breech is where our air channel is. So we want to make sure we have a good line between the two. So what we're going to look for, or at least the way I usually do this, is get it to where your ports in your valve, if you have two ports, some of them only have one, uh, but wherever wherever you're dealing with, if you're dealing with a flat on one side and a port on one side, you want to line that all up or get as close as possible, and then I will usually take my valve retention screw, go ahead and run it in a little bit so that you get a bite on the valve and you know it's not going to pivot, 
then we'll lock down our valve nut. Now that you want to give a decent squeeze to. And we can back this back out, make sure everything is lined up. It's lined up nice and pretty. So we can run that down in. Now this is not, uh, this particular screw, actually that is not the correct one. That's a little bit long. So we're going to replace that real quick. Boop, told you, parts, parts hunting. Okay, so found the correct one real quick. And I want to show you, this is why we've talked about before in other videos, why it's important to, to pay attention to the little things um, because they do make a big difference. So this particular screw, like I said, all it's doing is holding that valve from pivoting. But if we look at the two different sizes here, massive amount of length difference. What that means is then the problem that we were having with this one is this being too long, it's going to protrude down from the bottom of the body, which means it's going to run into our frame. Which, so we're going to throw off our spacing with the sear. Everything is going to be just ever so slightly out of whack down here. So it's just something that, like I said, you pay attention to the little things. And if something doesn't feel right, something doesn't look right, ask questions. So, again, this is not something that you necessarily have to bury down in there. You don't want to tighten it, you know, ridiculously tight into the valve. You can damage the valve, which can create lips. Uh, on, on the other side of the air passage and can make them tough to get back out. Um, you can also block off a little bit of airflow depending on uh, whether you're using kind of a funky tapered one of these or not. So um, that's, uh, that's what you want to do with your valve. And as you can see, nice and flush. Some guys will take, uh, and I've actually done it myself a few times, some guys will take and put a drop of blue Loctite on this just as a thread sealant because in this particular valve, since that channel, the air channel in that valve is open both ways, there is quote unquote potential for a little tiny bit of air to get through those threads. That's not super likely, it's not necessary, but you're already here, and as always, you know, it's, it's better to be careful. Just don't be careful with red Loctite. You know, don't, it, it's the devil, leave it alone. So, we have our valve in to our body. There we go, that looks prettier. So now, the next thing in line is going to be our hammer. This is just a little stock WGP hammer. So I do typically keep around an old cocking rod that I have pulled the knob off of for some other purpose. And I'll use this to install my hammer. Slip it down into the body. Now obviously what we've done here is we have run the hammer lug up so that it's flush so that we can get it in. So we slip that down in, and we're looking for that hammer lug to be lined up and not off, okay? So we're gonna line that up, and that's where the cocking rod comes in, because it gives you something to actually keep a hand on instead of trying to pivot it around. So we're gonna take eighth inch Allen key, go down through the body here. Now this is something that's kind of neat with uh, with this body. I don't believe, you know, it's obviously a very, very old body. It's just kind of neat because it is pre-2K spec for the banjo bolt, but it does have the um, the adjustment hole for the hammer lug drilled, and it is also threaded for an IVG. Um, a lot of pre-2K markers were not threaded for an IVG. You used a Rex dialer or a, another system, a dialer system. Uh, this one has either, I mean, it doesn't appear to be modified. I think this is factory anno, but I'm no historian. I just build guns. So normally, like I said, we'll take that eighth inch Allen key. We'll go down through the body into the lower tube. And what that's doing is interlocking with the other side of the hammer lug. So now we're in our hammer lug. We've got a good lock on it. Whenever I'm setting something up, and we'll go over timing later, but a really good starting point that I've found is from your starting position, three turns down. So just like with any other screw or bolt, righty tighty, lefty loosey. So we're going to turn clockwise three full turns. And it's a stiff one. So if you need a little bit of assistance, pliers, wrench, whatever the hell, can add a bit of leverage for you. 
anytime you're using an adjustable wrench, especially on a marker, you know, that you've just had anode or a customer's gun or anything like that, be careful. They do have sharp edges. It's really easy to scratch ammo. You know. So. There we go. I lost count. That's either three or four. But either way, um, we're just doing this for a slap together video. So I usually go from flush three turns down. So we have our hammer in, we're going to take our hammer spring, which is normally a slightly different size with a pre-2K because a lot of them had to use a dialer system, and since this is started for an IVG, we're using an IVG. So you want to make sure the back of the hammer has a little hollow cut in it, so you want to make sure your hammer spring is seated in there, and we're going to want to make sure that our hammer spring is seated into that little hollow in our IVG as well. Get your IVG started, and then we're just going to run it down flush. Now there is an O-ring on the IVG. It's not a sealing O-ring. It does not seal anything. There should be no air back here, okay? You shouldn't be dealing with that. That O-ring is just to add resistance, um, which I personally, a lot of the times, I will swap them out for a, uh, a 1590D, 015, 90D, Anytime you're looking at O-rings, when they there is a number and then a D afterwards, they're talking about what is called the durometer of that O-ring. The lower the durometer, the softer the O-ring is. Uh, so, for example, the um, uh, standard, you know, let's say a, a standard Buna rubber number 12, uh, whatever. These are usually when you pick them up in O-ring kits, stuff like that. These are usually a 70 D or 70 durometer, which is a really average durometer. A 90D, obviously higher durometer, much tougher, or not necessarily tougher, but much um, stiffer O-ring, so to speak. So when I put those on the IVG, it, it takes quite a bit more, it puts more quite a, uh, quite a bit more resistance onto it, so you never have to worry about that walking around, not that it's an extremely common problem. So basically, you have the core of your body and your internals together, okay? Like I said, not gonna make you work or not gonna make you watch the uh, rebuilds on a lot of this stuff. If you want to see them, we'll go over that later. For right now, we're just gonna mock everything up. So I'm gonna swap some O-rings around real quick, rebuild some stuff, add some barbs. We'll go from there. All right. So done a bit more cleaning and a bit more drinking, and away we go. So I did want to mention one thing because I forgot to cover it earlier, but. We started off with installing our VASA on the autococker body, and one thing that I forgot to mention, I usually recommend going ahead and installing your timing rod before you put the VASA on the autococker body. Um, biggest reason being, once you put your front block and everything on here, you don't have much pivot room back here at the back because you won't be able to make a full circle, you'll hit the body. Um, it's just it's easier to do it with the VASA off the body um, and if you're trying to save your timing, uh, the preset timing, whenever you're ripping something apart, it's another thing is you can disconnect from the three-way and then just go ahead and pull the VASA and the timing rod and uh, collar and everything as an assembly. Turn the heater off real quick. So, done some cleaning up on all of our other parts. Uh, I went ahead and uh, did a quick rebuild on most of our pneumatics because I am going to be new using these pneumatics. I haven't decided whether I'm going to stay with this reg or not, so I did not rebuild this. We're just going to use it for a mock-up, and I will probably go ahead and rebuild it for, um, for a timing video for you guys. So we have all of our stuff rebuilt. Now we're going to go ahead and start putting everything together. So we have all of our parts. We've gone through them. We've redone the O-rings. A couple things to take note of in the RAM, uh, and this is one that I will probably do a video on, of one that's um, bo as boogered up as this one was. The shaft was really rough, it, it was all kinds of bent up and everything, so uh, straighten this out, repolish the shaft, resealed the, uh, resealed the RAM, and installed some barbs and everything. There is a number 10 O-ring on the, uh, the RAM piston itself, on the RAM shaft. There is a number 6 O-ring inside this lower collar. Now, like I said, if you guys want to do a rebuild video, we can do that. We'll go over kind of uh, tips and tricks to do that. But one thing, if you pull this open, and like I said, I'm a firm believer in um, 
rebuilding everything, if, if you're already going this far, you're trying to restore something or trying to bring it back to life, go ahead and go balls to the wall with it. Rebuild everything, replace all your O-rings, or at least pull them and check them. In this case, the number 10 O-ring that we pulled off of the piston itself was pretty soft, but so, so we're not going to use it in this application. But let's say that O-ring is just worn. It's not necessarily failing or crumbling or anything, but it's just worn. Well, we're already doing a rebuild, so we'll go ahead and replace it. You can take that old number 10 O-ring and use it on the very base of the ram here to use as a, kind of a mounting buffer when we go to put this on our front block. Um, this is the way I set my stuff up, as we've talked about before. 100 different ways to build these guns. Uh, I'm a firm believer you need a little bit of flex in your pneumatics in the front block. Um, fact is, stuff happens, things get bent, a lot of these parts have been around for many, many years, so you know there's a lot of wear and tear on them. Not everything is going to be perfectly straight, ready to go all the time. So, just something to keep in mind. You do want a little bit of flex in your front block. So, we're going to run over a couple things here real quick. Try to get this all slapped together in a timely manner. So, we're going to take our RAM, install it into the front block. Standard thread, and as always, if it's fighting you, don't fight back. So this one, for example, this is something I will go ahead and show. I can feel, yeah, that's a relatively fresh anode on the front block. So it, it is kind of stiff. Uh, this is really the only use that I have for ANS rams. Uh, they have a steel base which means steel versus aluminum, steel is going to win. So as long as we make sure that we're not cross-threaded, these make a, uh, are a really good option for chasing out the ram mount threads on your front block without having to buy the tap. So we can kind of thread this in. And get a good clean thread there. There we go. Now we're happy. This is a little snug still. So, quickly install that. Now, you do want to be careful when you're installing pneumatics on your front block. Depending on your front block setup, um, some take a bit of planning. There are some components out there that are definitely. Um, interesting to put together on a front block to say they are uh, you know some oddly shaped ones uh, if you've ever assembled a hybrid front block for example it's it's definitely interesting trying to get everything to line up correctly um, so take note of it don't get frustrated take your time so now we have that we have a ram installed on our front block and the next thing we're going to do is install our pump arm and back block so one thing we want to look at here is obviously we have threads on the ram shaft here, okay, which are going to thread into the tip of our pump arm. We also have threads on the back. One of the biggest things here, again going with steel fighting against aluminum, is I always make it a big priority to get as much thread as possible into the meat of the back block. Okay, we can make adjustments on the RAM side, but it is very important that you have as much engagement as possible in the back block. This is where a lot of your stress is going to be, um, and again, steel fighting against aluminum, steel is going to win in, in a, a bad setting here. So we're going to thread as much as possible into that front block, but this is also where we're going to start thinking about timing a little bit. Now I'm not going to set this up, uh, you know what, hell with it, we'll go ahead and do it. Like I said, this is um, about the only place in an auto cocker that I will ever use red Loctite because red Loctite is the devil. But usually what I will do is take my pump arm and just basically a single drop of red Loctite actually right on the tip of that. And then we'll take a dental pick or something else of the like, pop the bubble, and kind of fish it down into the threads. So this way, if there is any funk in those threads inside that pump arm, it's not going to 
if we if we applied the red Loctite to the RAM side, it's going to push that red Loctite off if we have funk in the threads on our pump arm, which again, we're working with, you know, some decently old hardware here. So it's very possible that that could have some funk in it. So now what we're going to do is kind of maybe a little hard to see, but I'm going to scoot the ass end of the body off of the table so that we have room to pivot everything. We're going to line up our ram arm and our pump arm, get that threading started. And like I said, there may be some funk in the pump arm, so you'll find resistance. And then this is another portion where I absolutely love these pliers. So we'll just adjust those out a little bit, and I can grab onto that ram arm, there we go, without doing any sort of damage. Okay, so we're just going to hold that and start threading in. As we're setting this up, like I said, this is where we're going to start thinking about timing, okay? So one of the big things when you're timing an autococker, and this is, you know, we'll cover it more in depth when we do a timing video, but one of the things when you're timing an autococker is setting the back block distance, okay? So what that means here is we're going to thread in a little bit. There you go, you can kind of see a little bit better. Thread in a little bit, and then push your back block in, okay? We want to make sure that that back block is not contacting the body at all. The Autocockers have a reputation for having that clack, clack, clack sound. And the problem is, is that reputation comes from people who don't know how the hell to set up their damn guns. It should not make that noise, okay? It's not supposed to be slapping. That can cause a lot of damage to your back block. So, what we're going to look at, there is a bend in the pump arm. Your ram actually sits further out from the body than your pump, or than your uh, back block is, you know, where they thread in. So, there's going to be a bend, then it's going to bend inwards towards the body, which is going to let us line up with the back block. So if we put that bend where it's supposed to be, and then just back our back block back to its correct position, now we can kind of gauge whether we are close enough or not. Obviously this, we're a little far off. So, again... One of the things that I really like about these pliers, we can kind of move this out a little bit, hold on to our pump arm, and now that we're just making some pretty minute adjustments, I can make those adjustments at the ram side instead of having to spin the whole back block and reset everything, okay? So, we make a little bit of adjustments, make sure everything's lined up, recheck and this actually that worked out about perfectly now see if we can see there if we line that up you can just barely see through what i usually like to do is find that point where your threading for the back block is and push you want to simulate as much force as possible on this because there is going to be a decent amount of force from the ram so in this case there's a couple little bitty spots where I can't see light through. So I'm going to back the ram side off just the tiniest bit. Now, now we still need a little more adjustment. That's what now I. So like I said, this is one of the things I like about these pliers because if you do need to get a hold of the other end of the pump arm, you can do so and still have plenty of room to move around. Okay, now we have a much better gap. So we're going to leave that there. Um, let's see. That's going to bug me. It's just the tiniest bit too much gap. There we go. Okay, now we're perfect. So, um, kind of an old school rule. They used to say, you know, take a piece of paper, and if you could slide a piece of paper between your back block and your body, then you were good, um, you know, without any resistance. 
I usually kind of look for light between the two, but you can check them with paper as well. So we have our RAM installed, and this, like I said, is the beginning of our timing. So we've already set our back block distance. So now we're going to go ahead and install our bolt and bolt pin. This one is pretty stiff. Install that. Install that. We're going to throw in our timing rod, or timing rod, uh, cocking rod, just for right now. Kind of mock everything up. Like I said, we're just doing a build this time. Okay, so we've got everything is nice and happy together. And we're going to flip it over. Here's our three-way that we're going to be using. Just a, uh, a small 2K spec chrome WGP two-ring three-way. Uh, four-way, whatever you want to call it. These are, uh, like I've said before, big fan of WGP components. They just, they got it right. It's as simple as that. Um, now, on the back, like I showed you with the RAM, how I will typically use a uh, an O-ring for the mounting. This is a number 12 O-ring. Uh, it's always what I use to mount my three-ways. So we're going to go ahead and install that. And like I mentioned before, a lot of the times you will have to configure what is going to go on when when you're installing the front block because certain things are going to get in the way of others. The three-way, for example, obviously with these barbs being here, there's no way I could have an LPR installed and still in, uh, install my three-way without removing the barbs. So I don't want to mess with that. So instead, this is what we're doing. We're installing it first because I know the barbs on our sledgehammer LPR will clear everything. So now we're going to take a small Allen key and you can see the three-way shaft through the front of the three-way so we're just going to poke that wiggle that into our timing rod 